Hi friends. So it's been a while, I know. Um, yeah, it's been kind of rough over here. I, I don't really want to go into it too much and bore you with my problems, but basically I lost a family member in August to a heart attack and it's, it's just been a very tough 12 months. Like I said, I don't really want to go into it, but you can check my community tab for some of that information and that stuff if you are curious. And if you hear that wheezing sound in the background, that is my dog. He sounds like a 70 year old asthmatic chain smoker, but he's just a Yorkshire Terrier, so ignore that. Anyway, I am back today and I thought since we are in October and it's spooky season, and there are a lot of good horror movies coming out at the moment. I would try to do something a little bit different. So we're going to be looking at five horror movies and the true crime cases that inspired them or that mimic them in some way. And at the same time, I'll be sketching an iconic horror movie still from the movie Psycho. Warning, obviously, there could be spoilers for you. And there are obviously movies like Zodiac, that draw directly from a true crime case but today I'll be covering movies that are more kind of loosely inspired by true cases instead of directly inspired. So the first movie on the list is the 2008 home invasion horror movie The Strangers and this is about a couple who are tormented throughout the night by three masked intruders. When dawn finally comes, the intruders tie up the couple and prepare to stab them to death. And it's at this point that one of the creepiest horror movie lines of all time is delivered. Why are you doing this to us? Because you're home. The lack of emotion combined with lack of motive makes this truly chilling. This movie was inspired partly by the Manson family murders. On August 8th and 9th, 1969, cult leader Charles Manson directed a group of his followers to go to the house where actress Sharon Tate lived with her director husband, Roman Polanski, and to murder everybody in the house as brutally as possible. Tate was pregnant at the time and Polanski was out of town. Tate had three of her friends over that night. Hairstylist Jay Sebrig, coffee heiress Abigail Folger, and her boyfriend Wojciech Frybowski. Manson follower Tex Watson drove to the estate with Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Linda Kasabian. When they arrived on the property after midnight, they encountered Stephen Parent, who was an 18-year-old, and he had been visiting the estate's caretaker at his house at the, in the guest house. Uh, Tex Watson shot Stephen Parent to death before he, Atkins, and Cranwinkle then broke into the main house, leaving Kasabian to be the lookout outside of the gate. The four people inside the home were made to gather in the living room, and then Tate and Sebring were linked by ropes which were tied around their necks. Sebring was shot and stabbed seven times. Frygowski and Folger were taken to a bedroom, but they actually managed to free themselves and they tried to run away, but both were chased down and killed by Krenwinkle and by Watson. Frygowski was stabbed over, over 50 times. And then finally, either Atkins or Watson fatally stabbed Sharon Tate to death, and this after having to witness her friend's death, which is horrific. As they left the scene, Atkins used some of Tate's blood to write the word pig on the front door. The following night, the group decided to murder someone else, and they randomly selected the house of a grocery store owner, Leno Labianca, and his wife, Rosemary. There were a couple of other followers with them that night, including Manson. The couple were robbed, tied up, and stabbed to death. Again, their blood was used to write words at the crime scene. The cult was then arrested and put on trial in June of 1970, with uh, Kasabian being the lead witness for the prosecutor, so she was granted immunity. The rest, including Manson, were found guilty and received the death penalty. 
but then their sentences were commuted to life in prison because California abolished capital punishments in 1972. Charles Manson died behind bars in 2017. I have a full video on the Manson murders and I will link it above. Movie number two on our list today is The Black Phone, which was released earlier this year to much critical acclaim. It is a very good movie, and I think part of its success is drawing on very real fears because of the similarities to real cases. The Black Phone is about a sadistic, masked killer who kidnaps young boys and keeps them locked in his basement, where he assaults them and then murders them. He then buries the bodies on a property he owns. He kidnaps a 13-year-old boy who makes contact with the spirits of the killer's previous victims via a broken phone in the basement, and the previous victims then guide him in how to defeat the killer. The movie was inspired in some part by a number of similar true crime cases. The most obvious is the case of the killer clown, John Wayne Gacy, who raped and murdered 33 boys and young men and buried most of them on his property beneath his home before being apprehended in the 70s. He was considered a pillar of his community, and he often threw parties and entertained children dressed as a character he called Pogo the Clown. But he was living a dark double life. He would pick up teenage runaways or offer young men and boys from the ages of 14 to 21 odd jobs to lure them into his home, and once inside, he would sometimes give them alcohol and then he would trick them into putting on a pair of handcuffs by saying that he was going to do a magic trick. And he would then restrain them, assault them, and either strangle or suffocate them. Gacy was put on trial, convicted, and sentenced to death, and he was killed by lethal injection in 1994. I will do a full video on Gacy in the future because I, th I would like to cover the story in a more victim-centered way. Gacy unfortunately had some fans, including a man called Dean Coral, who drew inspiration from Gacy for his own killing spree of young men and boys. I have a full video on Coral and I will also link that above if you are interested. And movie number three is the movie that changed slasher movies forever, Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 classic Psycho. This movie is about a reclusive man who is into taxidermy and has an unhealthy attachment to his mother, to the point where after she dies, he keeps her mummified remains and wears her clothes, and adopts an alter ego as his mother as though she is still alive. Whilst in this persona, he murders several women. This movie was inspired by the true story of Ed Gein, and if you haven't watched my video about him, I would recommend it because I go into a lot more detail about him. Ed Gein was a man who lived a very isolated life as a hermit and had a very abusive and possessive mother. She forbade him from making friends or having a girlfriend, saying that all women are sinful. And in essence, she was his only friend before she died. So after her death, Gein murdered two women who reminded him of his mother by shooting them and robbed the graves of other middle-aged women who reminded him of his mom. And then he took their body parts and their skins and created ornaments for his home, like chair covers, lampshades, and bolts. And he also constructed a, like a woman's suit from their skins, which he would put on and wear. And psychiatrists believe that he was trying to embody his mother to kind of keep her alive somehow. He was found to have been insane at the time of the crimes, and he spent the rest of his life in an institution and died there. The story of Ed Gein was so shocking that it inspired not only Psycho, but multiple horror movies, including the character of Leatherface in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, who likes to wear the faces of his victims, and the character of Buffalo Bull in Silence of the Lambs, who murders women to create a woman's suit to wear. Movie number four on our list is Midsommar. Midsommar is a story about a woman who loses her entire family to a double murder suicide and then accompanies a mysterious foreign exchange student, her boyfriend, and his friends on a trip to Sweden to visit the community of the Horga. As her friends are murdered one by one, she is indoctrinated by the Horga, who are actually a white supremacist cult. 
Whilst the director Ari Aster hasn't explicitly said so, the details of the cult make it clear that it is loosely inspired by a real murderous white supremacist cult, the Colonia Dignidad in Chile. The cult was founded by a Nazi and pedophile, Paul Schaeffer, who fled from Germany with around 300 of his followers and set up the isolated, self-sufficient white supremacist sect in Chile. Schaeffer set up underground rooms used to torture and even murder people who were critical of the Chilean dictator Pinochet. Schaeffer also tortured cult members who would step out of line, and he also molested children on the compound. He was finally arrested after Pinochet was overthrown, and he was then sentenced to 20 years for child sexual abuse. He died five years into his sentence. I have a full video on the Colonia Dignidad and the story, which again I will link if you are interested. The fifth and final movie for this video is Jennifer's Body, a cult classic 2009 horror movie about a rock band who decides to sacrifice a virgin to Satan to become famous. They choose Jennifer, who tells them that she's a virgin, thinking it'll discourage them from raping her. However, because she's not a virgin, the sacrifice goes terribly wrong, and Jennifer instead turns into a succubus who murders and feasts on the flesh of boys. The plot, besides the succubus part, is eerily similar to the true crime case of Elise Parler. It was July 22nd, 1995, when 15-year-old Elise was lured from her home. Under the guise of hanging out and smoking marijuana, she met up with 16-year-old Royce Casey, 15-year-old Jacob Delashmut, and 14-year-old Joseph Fiorella in a eucalyptus grove um, in California, a distance of around a quarter mile of her home. Immediately when she arrived, the boys ambushed her and stabbed her to death, and then admittedly afterwards they desecrated her body. She had been stabbed at least 12 times. However, an autopsy would later determine that she didn't die of her wounds, but of blood loss. Eight months after the murder, Roy Casey walked into a police station and turned himself in and confessed to everything. He explained that one of the group's biggest inspirations was the metal band Slayer, so much that they started their own band that they called Hatred. And by the summer of 1995, they realized that the band wasn't gaining the popularity they'd hoped for. So Joseph Fiorella came up with a solution. Let's make a deal with the devil by sacrificing a virgin. So that's what they did. And they chose um, Elise because they thought that being a beautiful blonde virgin, they would get the notoriety that they wanted. They were all tried separately in 1997. Um, Joseph Herrera pled guilty to first-degree murder in exchange for a life sentence with a possibility of parole after 26 years. He is still in prison today. Jacob Jellismut took a similar deal and was also sentenced to life with a possibility of parole, also with a minimum of 26 years, and he's also in prison. And Royce Casey, the guy who confessed to the whole thing, did not contest the life sentence and was sentenced with parole after a minimum of 21 years. In June of this year, he was granted parole. And Elise's parents are allegedly not opposed to his parole because he did show genuine remorse and he turned his life around in prison, but they are vehemently opposed to parole for the other two. So that is it for that story. Rest in peace to Elise and to all the victims who did not deserve to die in such a brutal way. That's all for today's video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye! Take me back to a place where I felt at home Take me back to a day when we weren't alone Take me back to an age when the world felt small Way back before we blew it all Take me back to a place where I felt at home Take me back to a day when we weren't alone Take me back